Hi there, this is Alex Soth, and I'm back in my library in St. Paul, Minnesota for another rambling photo book talk. The theme this time around is what I'm calling emotional marginalia. Um, it's sort of hard to describe what I'm talking about. I, I guess uh, notes and footnotes and, and strands of thought, really, um, that have emotional content uh, that lie outside of the photograph itself. Um, again, hard to explain except by example. And, and the example that started this all uh, came from a letter that was uh, just randomly sent to me from a fellow named Trent in Austin, Texas. And this letter that he sent, let me, let me show it to you, uh, looks like this. And uh, basically what it was, was a, um, was a letter in which uh, he told me that a copy of Interior America by Chauncey Hare at the University of Texas Library uh, the circulating copy had notes written from Chauncey Hare to the photographer Russell Lee uh, inscribed within. And it's absolutely fascinating to me. But just, um, just to give you a little background, let me just show you a little bit of Chauncey Hare's work. Um, these pictures were made in the 1970s. And what uh, Chauncey Hare was, was interested in was uh, the interior world in America. And these pictures were made all over. This is in Oakland, California. This is in Covington, Kentucky. Cheyenne, Wyoming. California. What seems at first straightforward gets a lot more complicated once you get a glimpse into the interior mind of Chauncey Hare. And, um, and these notes give a little bit of that. Um, you know, for example, there's, there's one here of, uh, let's see. This picture, it, uh, which says, uh, th so there's a little boy running down the street here. I don't know, let me see if I can show that to you. There's a little boy running down the street, and it says, that's me in my mind's eye, flying down the street, putting on my coat in 1940, age six, on the way to school. Um, so that gives you, you know, that's, that's a little window into the fact that he's a, thinks about his boyhood, he's a dreamer, whatever. The one that, that really slayed me was this note. And it, it corresponds to the second to last picture in the book right here. And, um, and so what this note says is up here, it says, great love to you, dad. Oh, if you could see. I'm still feeling the pain. Okay, remember, these are notes written to photographer Russell Lee, but he actually <laughs> speaks these words to his father because we learn this is a picture of his father. This says, uh, this is my father just several weeks before his cancer was diagnosed around Christmas time, 1971. He died July 30th, 1979. He lived to see this book and his own photograph and read the text, which he would not discuss with me at the end. Um, so it's, there's kind of a mystery right there. Uh, and then the other notes, uh, he says, samples of my early landscape photos. So these pictures back here, uh, he says, a la Ansel Adams, 
Uh, and he talks about how this house sits empty. Um, but again, so he mentions that his father would not discuss the essay at the beginning of the book. Well, if you read that essay, which I really encourage you to do. So, you know, I often will just skip the essay in a book. Um, really, uh, it changes everything with Chauncey Hare in this book and in others to read those essays. It's probably, um, well, one of the most intense and unusual <laughs> forwards to a book. It is the single most intense and unusual forward to a book. So I'm just gonna, gonna take you through it. This is not such a visual exercise, but I but I think it's fascinating. So he starts uh, to be white, male, 22 years old, with a new wife and an engineering degree from a st prestigious university, was just about the best thing that a person could be in 1956. Then he then he goes on over here, but something was wrong right from the start. For one thing, there was height. I've since discovered that most good photographers are about five foot seven. All successful corporate men appear to be around six feet. I am five foot six. Okay, so he's got he's got some height issues. Then uh, he goes on. Uh, I was born in Niagara Falls in June 1934. As a child, I was undersized, poor in sports, but always at the top of my class attributes that can guarantee a lonely American boyhood. Then he really goes uh, deep into his family, and you can imagine why his father didn't want to talk about this. So he writes, We did not have a rich family life. My mother was beautiful and intelligent, but she kept it all under wraps. She made herself insignificant. She would suffer long depressions and lock herself in her room for days. Uh, in 1942, a brother was born, but I've never had any feelings of close contact with him. So it's quite unusual. I mean, this is a documentary book about interior homes in, in the United States, and he is talking very... Uh, very honestly, but brutally honestly, about his own family life. But it gets even more intense when he talks about his, his own relationships. Uh, so he mentions uh, marrying this woman, Gertrude, uh, and here he says, I, I've always cared deeply for Gertrude, and I respect her. She is an intelligent, hardworking woman, who had no particular ambitions of her own that she was able to express to me. There was, I believe, a similarity between my marriage and my father's relationship to my mother, in which the woman was a shadowy, almost insignificant partner. Through photography, I had embarked on an exploration of myself, but it was not something I was able to share with Gertrude. We seldom spoke to one another. Even our most intimate moments were less than satisfactory compromises between her instinctive opposition to birth control and my reluctance to have a child. Whoa. Um, then he says, later that year, our son Victor was born. He must have sensed that he wasn't wanted at first. He didn't talk for the first six years. Oh, it almost hurts to read it. Um, so later on in the essay, uh, he talks about, he, he talks more about his discovery of photography and then his fascination with the, uh, these interior spaces going into people's homes. Uh, but he says, homes and public buildings were not the only interiors I sought out. The urge for discovery went within as well, and I, be and I began exploring my own inner fortress of defenses and inhibitions. I began a series of studies of women, some of them prostitutes. I came to know several of them as friend and lover, 
and for a while I was immersed in the lives of a heroin-addicted prostitute named Jackie and her daughter, and also became acquainted both with Jackie's pimp and her mother. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's, it, it, it's like a, a drama is playing out in this book, and, um, and, and he eventually talks about leaving Gertrude and his father's death, but this all was, was spurred to mind again by this footnote. Uh, and, and probably, you know, the vast majority of people that have ever looked at uh, interior America have just looked at the pictures, they've seen this picture, and they wouldn't even know that that is Chauncey Hare's father. So I just think it's, it's interesting how these little nuggets of information um, change the way we read pictures, and particularly when these nuggets have emotional content. So um, another, another book that, that I recently was looking at that brought this to mind was The San Quentin Project by Nigel Poor. This was recently published by Aperture and um, is, a, is a fantastic book in so many ways. But um, this is a book that needs to be read. Um, and it's a bit of work to get, to get into, but I, uh, I really recommend reading Nigel Poor's introduction here. And, and so, th so this book is all about uh, the work that Nigel Poor has done with the San Quentin prison, but she, she came to it in this very serendipitous way. And, and she starts by saying, prisons didn't come into my life because I had been incarcerated or because I was visiting a family member or a friend inside. It didn't come into my life because I was politically involved with issues around incarceration. Uh, she talks about this, this very serendipitous thing that happened. So she was listening to uh, National Public Radio, and she heard this story about a, a prison in St. Petersburg Cresty Prison, it's called, and um, the fact that they had fallen on hard times economically, and so they were allowing tourists uh, to pay a fee and to come, you know, gawk at the prisoners uh, and, and as a way to make money. And she was interested in this, um, not necessarily in being a visitor herself, but she was, she was curious. So she went to St. Petersburg, and one of the things that she discovered is outside of the prison, these unusual uh, uh, objects on the ground outside the prison. And what they are is that they're notes written by the prisoners and folded up. And, and then they're, they're stuffed into this little piece of um, like chewed bread and thrown out the window like paper airplanes, and they're, they're messages from the prisoners to the outside world. And Nigel Poor thought this was, you know, this uh, incredibly poetic, romantic gesture, uh, which, it might, which they very well might be, but they also might be um, messages of a criminal nature to people in the outside world. So there's, there's some question about that, and she talks about uh, her, her kind of, uh, her confusion about that matter. And, and goes on, uh, to say that, um, that it just, that it just started this interest. And then what happened was out of the blue, um, a letter arrived at her house from San Quentin State Prison, but it was misaddressed. And she really wanted to read it, but she, brought it to the right address, and it sort of provoked this interest in her. And she writes something really beautiful here. She says, these experiences spoke to something I'm interested in, communication and how we share and understand or misunderstand personal, social, and experiential cues. 
I started thinking more about prisons and wondering about how to communicate with people inside. Uh, so then she goes on and um, learns about a, uh, a, a, a prison university project and decides to start uh, teaching photo history in prison. And so that leads her to uh, doing this, uh, these assignments with students. So there's this, uh, this other little book I have by TBW Books um, in which these two photographs here, one by Sugimoto, one by Mizrak, uh, are given uh, to a prisoner as an assignment, and he writes uh, his response to them. And this, this is included in this book as well, um, and it's quite interesting. Um, but the example of this that really hit me was, was this one right here. And, and, and what's so fascinating to me about this is the picture chosen. So the, the, um, the Sugimoto and the Mizrak pictures are, you know, are pretty iconic photos. And, and there are other examples. This, this, this well-known Stephen Shore picture, um, and there's a well-known Joel Sternfeld picture. But this, this photograph by William Eggleston isn't, isn't his most famous by any means, and, and is such a, uh, it's, it's such an example of, of, of a deadpan, of a really deadpan photograph. Um, and, and it's from his project, the, the Democratic Forest, which I talk about in a different video. But uh, in the end, the anonymous uh, prisoner who wrote about this photograph brings an incredible amount of emotional content to it. And it's done on two pages because the assignment was first of all to, um, to just analyze the photograph and then to write a story. So in the analysis, um, the, this, this prisoner looks very closely at it and notices some things that, that for sure I hadn't noticed while just flipping through the book. So notices that uh, there's no license plate here is curious about this door, this open door back here. Uh, notices right here that this is, uh, it says Camp Shelby, that this is a military uh, license plate. And, and th that this color also evokes the military. Okay? So, but then we go to this page. And... And over here, um, he talks about how, uh, well, he says, this is how I spent most of my weekends, working on the cars of my wife's girlfriends. Uh, she offered my services freely because she knew that most of them couldn't pay. Um, down here, he says, the more I look at this picture, the more meaningful it becomes. I spent so much time with this photograph pondering, sometimes talking to myself about it, in an undertone that has become the most important, meaningful set of images to me in 15 years. So why? Because it, it brings up this, this time, partly this time period of his, uh, of, of being, of working on cars, but there's much more over here. And and I'm going to read that uh, now. It says, I drove into the parking lot into a police raid. I was ordered out of my car, and because I did not react quick enough, I was dragged to the ground, hit in the ribs with a club, and kicked a few times by a police officer. The police continued to brutalize everyone outside the apartment, including women, for about 45 minutes. After not finding any drugs, they got back into their cars and drove off. After they were gone, I went into my apartment. Just then, my four-year-old daughter ran up to me, wanting to get a hug and to play, as she always did when I got home. I said to her, not now. She kept insisting. My reaction was to backhand her the way I would a grown-up. 
After I realized what I did, I reached out to her, but she was so afraid of me that she stood there and peed herself. I hated myself for taking my anger out on someone I truly would give my life for. I spent a long time trying to make amends to her. So this very innocuous photograph brings all of that out of him and becomes this wildly important picture. And, and I just think now when I flip through the democratic forest, every time I see that picture, I'm going to bring something else to it. And it's these layers of information, these layers of meaning that we can bring to pictures and to books uh, over time. And it's kind of like that writ written marginalia on the sides of books. Um, you know, I don't write in my photo books in that way, but I think uh, in my mind I'm writing on the books and adding layers of meaning over time. And to me, in the end, that's so much of the value of photography and photo books is that, is that story outside of the picture that we bring to it or that the photographer brings to it or someone else entirely, um, but that informs the picture and kind of fills it up for us. And, and as a photographer, what I'm interested in doing is thinking about the different ways that can happen. Doing it myself, um, by having a, a caption that changes the reading of the picture, or finding more subtle ways to inject that meaning, and hopefully leave space for the viewer to bring their own meaning to the picture. So there you have it. Uh, that was kind of a, uh, a quick little video, probably a lot more reading than looking at pictures, but um, so it goes. So I, uh, I hope you enjoyed it, and I will see you next time.